This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. As we continue to look at um, the race, uh, particularly looking at uh, Michael Bloomberg running for mayor in New York City, he equated a coveted endorsement from the United Federation of Teachers with the, quote, kiss of death. Um, he went on to say um, in this, quote, I don't know what goes through voters' minds, but maybe they understand if the UFT wants it. It ain't good, and you don't want that person. We're staying with uh, Hamilton Nolan, the uh, In These Times labor reporter. Um, Hamilton, can you talk about this larger union issue and the billionaire um, presidential candidate, Michael Bloomberg, who will take the stage in the debate, uh, pre presidential primary debate, for the first time tonight in Las Vegas. Yeah, it's really very striking uh, having Bloomberg jump into the race. I mean, because coming into the 2020 race, I think you could make a really good argument that it was the most promising election year for organized labor in a long time. Um, the president was weak. Uh, there was a big Democratic field, so unions had a lot of, of candidates to choose from. The presidential candidates all really competed very strongly for union endorsements. They all put out labor plans that are uh, far more progressive than, than anything we've seen uh, in recent U.S. history. Uh, so unions, I think, are well positioned, and now you have this this mega billionaire jumping into the race, and Mike Bloomberg, as you pointed out, is not well-liked by unions, especially in New York, unions that dealt with him when he was the mayor of New York. Uh, it's fair to say he is not a great friend of unions, not super popular with unions that have dealt with him. Um, and so it's it's this wild card in the race, and it's, it's almost like a cartoon uh, battle now in the Democratic primary, especially if Bernie Sanders uh, ends up being the leading candidate, as he is now, if he, if he keeps up with that and Bloomberg uh, buys his way into the race. I mean, you really have such a strong contrast of visions for the Democratic Party and for organized labor between, you know, are, are people going to back the money or are they going to back the socialist? Uh, and Hamilton, in that uh, in that vein, it wasn't just that he was in um, in strong opposition to organized labor. I think the, many of the unions, when he left office, hadn't even been able to get a contract for up to five years uh, because the mayor refused to grant them any. But he also, in a broader sense, uh, he not only opposed fifteen dollar uh, fifteen dollars an hour for uh, in the raise in the minimum wage. He 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 opposed any raise in the minimum wage. He also opposed uh, paid sick leave when it was. Paid Past in New York City, so many of the issues that go beyond just organized unions, but have an impact on the on working people in general. He's on the the side that the Democratic Party has left supposedly, because all of these issues now most of the Democratic Party uh, candidates, presidential candidates, support. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, remember, Mike Bloomberg was a Republican not that long ago, and uh, I think at heart, uh, Mike Bloomberg probably still is a Republican, and Mike Bloomberg's governing record uh, in many areas. I mean, obviously, he has issues like climate change and gun control that he touts that he's been progressive on. But in many areas, he governed like a Republican. And uh, it's, it's kind of shocking to see, you know, Mike Bloomberg decide to run for president and issue a press release and say, by the way, I was wrong about stop and frisk, for example. Uh, when he spent years and years and years defending this policy in New York uh, when he was in control. So, um, again, I guess the analytical thing to say is it'll be a test of how credulous voters are when he says that he's changed his heart on all these various issues compared to what you look at his actual record is. Hamilton Nolan, you've reported on the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers' announcement that it's endorsing Joe Biden for president. It was his biggest union endorsement campaign so far in this presidential campaign. Then nearly 1,300 IBEW members who support Bernie Sanders sent a letter to union membership asking them to retract that decision. The letter from um, the IBEW members for Bernie blasts the union's leadership for endorsing Biden without a vote of members and says, in part, quote, We're 
We're disappointed the International has instead thrown their weight behind the Biden campaign without member consultation and says they support Sanders' quote, transformative vision for expanding the labor movement, as well as the democracy and the solidarity that his campaign embodies. Talk about the significance of this and what you think will happen with the IBEW. Yeah, I mean, there's really two issues here. Um, the first is kind of the, the split between progressives and leftists within organized labor and uh, moderates and centrists within organized labor, the establishment of organized labor. Uh, Joe Biden obviously has some stronger connections to what you would consider to be the moderate factions of organized labor. He was endorsed by the firefighters. He was endorsed by the iron workers. Uh, and by the IBW, which was his biggest endorsement, more than 700,000 members. Um, and all these unions have factions within them that are far more progressive, probably, than the union leadership. And in the case of the IBW, uh, what you saw was these Bernie supporters within the union put together a letter with, with a, a huge amount, 1,300 uh, names of union members. And the point that they made was not just that they want the union to endorse Bernie, which is not actually what they asked for. What they asked for was a vote of the members for the endorsement. And that's really the second issue is union democracy. I mean, I think there's a, there's a fair argument to be made that a labor union making a political endorsement that is not based on a vote of the members is, is to a certain extent, meaningless, because it really just means that the head of that labor union that's their preferred candidate. Uh, you know, if you have a union like the IBW with seven to eight hundred thousand members, um, and you haven't done a vote of the members, what does the endorsement really mean? So that's what you're seeing within the IBW, and I can tell you that that the same, the very same thing is happening within other unions that have issued endorsements that the members don't like as well. And finally, Marcy Wills, this is the first really diverse state uh, that the uh, primary and caucus is taking place in, the two of the whitest states, Iowa and New Hampshire, now done, and then it goes from Nevada, the caucus on Saturday, down to South Carolina. The significance of this? The significance is it will be sort of a test of both the strategies that have been enacted by unions and everyone else, and sort of how much people have been paying attention as individuals. Um, we need to start recognizing the policies that help diverse populations. And it's pretty clear that Medicare for All is one of those policies that would sort of represent the freedom that a lot of people have been looking for for a long time. We want to thank you both for being with us. Marcy Wells, member of the Culinary Workers Union Local 226 in Nevada, very powerful union there. And thanks so much to Hamilton Nolan, labor reporter within these times, both, both speaking to us from Las Vegas, Nevada.